Welcome to Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. Each week we'll walk you through the Epicurean texts and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. We're now in the middle of a series of podcasts intended to provide a general overview of Epicurean philosophy based on the organizational structure employed by Norman DeWitt in his book, Epicurus and His Philosophy. Now let's join the discussion. Welcome to episode 180 of Lucretius Today. We're continuing in chapter 13, The True Piety. And last week, we were beginning the discussion of the subsection entitled gradation in Godhead, and we were discussing the observation made by Joshua that in Epicurean theology, the gods are part of the great scheme of nature. Before we continue, though, it's always good for us to say something in general about where we are and the importance of what we're talking about. This whole chapter of true piety is oriented towards Epicurus's attitude towards the gods, which is contained in such a prominent position in principal doctrine number one, in the beginning of the letter to Menorchius, it's mentioned just about everywhere you find any discussion from Epicurus or Lucretius or any of the Epicureans. It's a fundamental point that you orient yourself with the knowledge that there are no gods creating or controlling the world, providing fate for you, giving you a mission in life, giving you an outcome in life, and not punishing you or rewarding you after death. And so that's the fundamental aspect of everything, which derives from both the physics and this observation that a blessed being, as described in principle doctrine number one, a truly blessed being is not going to be meddling in the affairs of beings that are lower than itself. It's it's going to be living in an environment in which it's totally happy and not causing any trouble for anyone else. There's a physics aspect of it, and there is a logic aspect of it, or anticipations or prolepsis aspect of it. And again, linking it back to last week, any gods that do exist are going to be part of nature and not above it or beyond it. There's nothing supernatural or outside nature in Epicurean philosophy. What the Epicureans came up with was this idea that there's nothing about the atoms and the bodies of the gods necessarily that would make them different. But by some method, if the gods are going to continue to live and not worry about dying, by some method, the gods have to be able to replace their atoms, be able to regenerate themselves over time and not decay. Perhaps the gods exist in this form as we would see a river or a Niagara Falls in the sense of a constant movement of atoms in and out of the bodies of the gods, just like the atoms of the river maintain the form of the Niagara Falls or the river itself. So that would be an example of a speculation about the nature of the gods that gives somebody who's interested in that subject an ability to come up with something that's not supernatural. And again, that would be the major purpose of everything we're doing in this section, is if we're going to talk about the nature of the gods, we're looking for explanations of the way the gods live and the bodies of the gods and their immortality, if they have one. We're looking for explanations that can be reasonable. So we can probably connect this back to Heraclitus and Aristotle and so forth by saying that if change is so rapid that knowledge becomes really impossible, where do you turn in order to build up your view and understanding of nature and where they turned in the ancient world, many of these thinkers, was to geometry, to the idea that, okay, what Euclid was doing with geometry was with a very few simple rules in place, you can use mathematics and logic to build this very elaborate system. As long as you could define basically a point in a line, you can follow that almost infinitely in this direction of expanding knowledge and defining terms and so forth. And you can do it with certainty because geometry exists, of course, in an abstract state outside of nature. And so how do you gain your understanding of the gods? Well, apparently by the same form, they applied this to astronomy, to everything, essentially. There was a follower of Pythagoras, and I've told this story before, who said that if you have one, that makes a point. If you have two, that makes a line. If you have three, that makes a surface. And if you have four, that makes a solid. And if you add them up, that makes 10. And so (laughs) 10 is the perfect number. That's the number of the 
heavenly spheres. And if we weren't as deaf and, and as degraded as we are now, we could, like our species used to be able to do in the Age of Heroes, we could actually hear that music, the music of the spheres. So it's not surprising that Epicurus is going to throw that whole line of thinking out the window. And so the question is, what is he left with? And one thing I don't think we talk about enough with reference to this issue, because what I hear you saying, Cash, is with issues relating to flux and flows and so forth, is that this is one explanation for how things might work. What we read in the letter to Pythocles when we went through that was this constant approach that Epicurus had to explaining things in nature by reference to multiple possible explanations. You don't become, as he said, you don't become enamored of the single cause and stick to that and just hold that in the face of all the evidence. You offer multiple explanations and one of them, one or more of them may turn out to be true, but you don't pin yourself down to one because that is almost certainly going to turn out to be wrong and it's unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Just like he's looking at the sky when you can't eliminate every possibility, but you can come up with several that may be true and are natural, then you've done all you really need to do to dispense at that moment with an idea that there's a supernatural issue behind it. Even under the most optimistic of constructions, we don't have nearly enough left in the Epicurean text to know what they were saying, but we can tell that what they were doing was constructing a theory of how the gods might exist that could be reasonable and natural and not require any kind of supernatural aspect to anything. Right. It's that same approach that you find in Pythocles. If there are natural explanations that are adequate to explain the phenomena, even if you don't know which one is right, but if you can enumerate a number of them, that's sufficient to push off the supernatural explanation. And once you do that for everything in the philosophy, the supernatural explanation is just rendered moot. There's no reason to call upon that when the natural explanation is better in every way. Josh, we had a good illustration of something that we're talking about in this whole chapter. Don posted a link to a discussion between a Catholic priest and a atheist podcaster, and they were talking about this issue of sumum bonum. And the way I would relate this is that the summum bonum issue is in terms of asking why you're doing something. And if you say you're doing it because you want to be healthy, well, why do you want to be healthy? And continuing on this series of why questions until you get the person who's thinking about the question of what ultimately motivates them to come down to some ultimate basic foundational principle of why he's doing everything he does. And the Catholic priest came down to this point that ultimately you come to some kind of an uncaused cause as your ultimate motivation for doing everything in life. And Joshua, your background is Catholic and you know much more about this than I do. But when I hear uncaused cause, I start thinking about Aristotle and a prime mover where you cross that boundary in religion or some types of philosophies between things that you can verify through physics and things that you can have a good reason to believe exist because of the evidence versus you just abandon evidence and go for the supernatural. And whenever I hear uncaused cause, that's the God these people want to assert. And, yeah, that's Thomas Aquinas, basically. He says that things exist, everything that exists must have a cause. And then he just asserts out of nowhere, there cannot be an endless chain of causation. For some reason, we don't know why he says that, but he says that. And then he goes on to say, so there must have been an uncaused cause. It's self-refuting, really. He says everything must have a cause, and then something must have not had a cause to get it all started. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even make sense internally. And of course, Epicurus throws the whole thing out because he says, no, there is, there is an endless chain of causation, that nature is eternal in both directions, that the atoms have always existed and will always exist, and that that's the cause. You don't need to look for something outside of nature. So maybe one thing to look at here would be what is Epicurus, what is he responding to? He's responding to, in part, the observation that he makes that all people have, or at least had in his time, this religious feeling. Everybody had an understanding of the gods. How do we explain that understanding in natural terms without reference to the supernatural? Because that would be a violation of everything in his physics. So how do we approach this question? And I guess two ways you could do it. One of them would be psychology. You could say, well, the reason that everybody has this belief in God is because of this particular evolutionary trait or that thing that we have from culture. But Epicurus is taking the approach of looking at nature itself and defining the gods in terms of their physics. 
It's an interesting argument, and I do occasionally like to read about it. Well, part of the importance of it from another discussion is it takes time to develop a background in Epicurus, Then many people come just because of his discussion of pleasure and the issue that you're going to want to live a happy life. And everybody, to some extent, wants to live a happy life, even a Catholic or any type of background. It's pretty unusual to find somebody who says, I'd like to live a painful life. But when you get down to this discussion of pleasure and you don't fully at the beginning understand how sweeping a term it is for Epicurus, you naturally might assume, just as Cicero was doing, that pleasure means stimulation, pleasure means sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and things like that. And a danger that is going to occur to everyone in life is that as they get older, as they get sick, as they get under unfortunate circumstances, those types of stimulating pleasures can be awfully hard to find or even something that we don't value, certainly the same way when we were younger or healthier or in better circumstances. So what's important here is to realize that Epicurus is coming at all of this from a fundamental perspective that the pleasure we're talking about is living without pain. And again, the reason we talk about these details of the gods is not that we have to know them in every moment, not that they're the primary issue involving gods, because the primary issue is just that they don't cause us any trouble and they don't punish us after death. That's the primary issue we always need to know. But it's important to realize that there are stages in life when somebody dies, when bad things happen to you. These questions are constantly out there, and there's always people out there who are about to throw them in your face when something bad happens and they tell you it's God's will or these things go on. And the only real way to be ready for those bad times in life is to have thought about these things ahead of time and to have this habit of approaching things rationally, approaching things according to the evidence, approaching things systematically, and exercising your mind in issues such as talking about, well, what would a God be like if he really existed can be an important part of that. One thing you said, I posted a video from that same Catholic bishop, Bishop Barron is his name. I posted his review of The Swerve, and I was reading the YouTube comment section for that because the name of Thomas Jefferson had come up, as it does in The Swerve and, and as it does in our discussions of Epicurean philosophy. One of the commenters had said that Thomas Jefferson was more of an Aristotelian, I think was what he said, because his goal was to pursue happiness or eudaimonia. And the point I wanted to make is that all of these schools that we're talking about, Stoicism, Epicureanism, all these schools essentially are eudaimonist in nature. They're interested in eudaimonia or happiness. And the question is, what is eudaimonia? What is happiness? And how do you get it? So that's what differentiates them, really. That's exactly what you were talking about with this issue of the summum bonum, which is, why are you doing what you do? Well, yeah, but why are you doing that? And then you just keep asking why, like any good two-year-old knows how to do, until eventually you get to the reason why you really do everything. And we can throw out this idea that it's because of an uncaused cause. So that's a jump from ethics to logic or physics. The reason we do everything in Epicurean philosophy is an ethical reason, and it is for pleasure. Which takes me back to Diogenes of Oinoander. Because when you quote somebody saying, well, Jefferson's an Aristotelian because he's a eunomonist and so forth. Yeah, everybody likes happiness. Again, most people don't have a problem with saying that happiness is a good goal. But as Diogenes of Oinoander said in his fragment 32, the issue is not what is the means of happiness, but what is happiness and what is the ultimate goal of our nature? And he said, both now and always, shouting loudly to all Greeks and non-Greeks, pleasure is the end of the best mode of life, while the virtues are no way an end, but the means to an end. So you can start at this higher level. Everybody wants happiness. Everybody wants pleasure. But they don't all agree about what happiness really is or really, in the end, how to get there. And it's these details about whether gods exist and what your attitude should be about them that really end up determining how you proceed in this department. We should probably move on to the next section, incorruptibility and virtue, which is on 267. And here, DeWitt brings out the point that Epicurus himself in his writings had not called the gods immortal. Epicurus doesn't say that they are deathless by nature. And in fact, when you go through the text, you can find references that suggest that Epicurus thought that the gods needed to act to maintain their deathlessness, and that, in fact, it would be reasonable to call the actions of the gods in maintaining their deathlessness to be the virtue of the gods. DeWitt says, the gods are characterized by two attributes, blissfulness and incorruptibility. Neither is inherent to their nature. 
They are incorruptible only because the contingency of destruction is avertable by their vigilance. And that ongoing pleasure causes the immortality as opposed to the immortality causing the ongoing pleasure. This issue of immortality versus incorruptibility seems important because something that was truly immortal in this natural, material, physical universe Mm -hmm. that we live in would be an aberration, wouldn't it? It would be something that was very difficult to explain in the terms that Epicurus had already set down. But he Mm -hmm. says here, quoting, I guess, the Andrea of Terence, where the happy lover is made to exclaim, I think the life of the gods to be everlasting for the reason that their pleasures are perpetual, because immortality is assured to me if no grief shall intervene to mar this joy. That's somewhat difficult to get a hold of. But the idea that pleasure is linked up in this. Yeah, Joshua, what you started off by saying is contained at the bottom of 267. And what you just said is consistent with it, but maybe we should drop back for just a moment. At the bottom of 267, gods are zoa, animate beings. They are also units in the ascending order of nature, as is man. Being in this order and corporeal, they cannot be deathless. If deathlessness were inherent in their nature, they would be in another class by themselves. And since they do belong in the same class as a man, it's a logical necessity to think of their incorruptibility as by some means preserved. And so that's where DeWitt is going here, is that because we think they're in the same class as human beings, and because, like you said a moment ago, there's nothing that's really eternal other than the atoms, you've got to make sure you don't violate your own rules there. And if nothing's eternal except an atom, then by some means, something that comes from the atoms, it's going to last only so long as it can be preserved. And so DeWitt says, since in the cosmos of Epicurus, unlike that of Plato, this incorruptibility lacked a superior being to guarantee its continuance, the sole possibility was that the gods preserved it for themselves by their own vigilance. Thus it must be discerned that just as the happiness of man is self-achieved, so the happiness of the gods is preserved. And he says, however astonishing this doctrine may seem, it is well authenticated. And he goes on giving these sites from Plutarch and so forth. The higher level principle seems to be that, again, gods are natural. And we have previously established that only the atoms have an unchanging eternal existence. And so, therefore, anything that comes from atoms, including gods, is not by nature imperishable and eternal, and it has to be sustained in some way. In the Epicurean universe, there's no supernatural gods that would sustain the lower gods. So it's a necessity of thought that you conclude that the gods must act somehow to sustain themselves. I was watching Monty Python yesterday, so that's what is prompting this thought. But (laughs) just as there's no supernatural god to oversee the natural gods, there's no super supernatural god Mm -hmm, to oversee the supernatural god or a super, super, supernatural god and so forth. You can take them in any absurd direction you want to go, but the point is well made here that if the only thing that you have is nature itself and what exists inside of nature, then the rules must necessarily be natural. It's true for the way that Epicurus thought of the gods. It's true for everything. That's that same argument that that Catholic priest is making. Super, 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 super. You at some point get tired of adding supers on top of it. But when you get to that point of getting tired of adding supers on top of it, that's not the time to give in and just say, oh, heck, I'm going to forget reason and rationality. I'm just going to go with a supernatural God. The option that Epicurus started tracing from the time he was 12 years old is that, no, there is no reason that there was ever a beginning eternality of the universe makes just as much sense and in fact a lot more sense than believing that there's some divine supernatural singular event that once in all of eternity something happened and a god arose and created everything or god got tired of sleeping or got tired of the existence beforehand and created everything by the way just in case people think i'm being very facetious with that my understanding is that there is an element in hinduism of this idea that It's not like when you die, you go to heaven. There are multiple heavens, some above the other, some below. So this idea has been pursued by people as being something worth studying. The idea that there are gradations 
even in the supernatural world. That reminds me, what's the seventh heaven? Is that something like what you're talking about? I remember that term from somewhere. Where does this term seventh heaven come from? Yeah, I mean, I know it was a TV show, and I think probably part of it might come from Dante. You know, Dante in his Inferno is going through all the courses and the circles of hell. But just like we've been talking about in this great chain of being, it's not a quick step just from humans right to God, right? It's humans and then kings and then angels and then archangels and saints and so forth until you get to God at the very top. Just like how in hell you have gradations of horror leading to Satan in the lowest pit at the bottom. In heaven, you have the same essential structure, except for its gradations in ascending order until you get to God at the top. Now, DeWitt mentions on 268, he gives examples from Plutarch, who criticized Epicurus and wrote, quote, freedom from pain along with incorruptibility should have been inherent in the nature of the blissful being standing in no need of active concern. DeWitt cites that should have been as a criticism, which means that he thought Epicurus said that the gods did have to take active concern over their well-being. And then Eusebius wrote, quote, according to Epicurus, it's goodbye to providence in spite of the fact that, according to him, the gods bring to bear all diligent care for the preservation of their own peculiar blessings. Again, DeWitt has numbers of references here that someone could pursue. But the bottom line being that the gods, whether they really exist or whether they're just a guide for us, they serve as an example of a being which is tending to its happiness, which is, again, what we should do ourselves. And he also quotes at the end of 270 that something similar appears in Plato. According to Pym, this eternity of the cosmos depends upon the will of the supreme demiurge. Since he was the creator, he could also destroy. It's impossible, however, to think of him as choosing to do so. Thus, the cosmos is eternal because it is subject to a contingency which will never occur. Even the immortality of the Christian falls in the same class, being the gift of God, it could be withdrawn. I guess the ultimate point remains that we're not violating our fundamental rules about there being nothing eternal but atoms and void. Even anything we entertain as being related to the gods is going to be subject to dissolution if proper steps are not taken to maintain it. Okay, so isonomy, <laughs> isonomia. Isonomy. Isonomy and the gods. And then he goes on to say, in spite of a supercilious opinion to the contrary, Epicurus was not a muddled thinker, but a very systematic one. That's what occurs to me as we read through this, is that whatever you take away from this, Epicurus is going to the trouble here, at the very least, of exploring every possible conclusion that might have an impact on this issue of the gods derived from his materialist physics. And it's probably worth doing, even if you decide to throw it all out. Yeah, that's right. And where DeWitt is going to focus in this section, isonomia is a principle that derives from infinity. And so isonomia, to the extent it derives from infinity, we can relate that back to the end of the letter to Pythocles, which ends, quote, all these things, Pythocles, you must bear in mind, for thus you will escape in most things from superstition and will be enabled to understand what is akin to them. And then Epicurus says, quote, and most of all, give yourself up to the study of the beginnings and of infinity and of the things akin to them, and also the criteria of truth and of the feelings and the purpose for which we reason these things out. For these points, when they are thoroughly studied, will most easily enable you to understand the causes of the details. And those who don't thoroughly take them to heart have not made their own, have not internalized the reason why we're studying these things in the first place. So I have to confess, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about infinity in the last week or two. But that apparently is the basis for coming up with this theory of isonomia and how things exist in the universe. Now, related to that, Lucretius just makes the observation that there's not a single thing of a kind. Nature never creates only a single thing of a kind. And so if you combine the idea that the universe is infinite in time and infinite in space, you could, I guess you could call eternality infinity in time. You've got infinity in time. You've got infinity in space. You've got nature never making only a single thing of a kind. And you have the ingredients for a lot of ideas with isonomia being the topic of this section, DeWitt suggests that we should understand isonomia to be equitable apportionment. The idea here is that if you have an infinite number of atoms, and if you have an infinite 
duration in which those atoms can come together and fall apart and spread and so forth. What you end up with is a universe in which really almost anything that is natural is possible. If you take, for example, the letter pi, 3.14, etc., every possible combination of numbers, every possible sequence of numbers will eventually happen in that infinite set of numbers that you have after 3.14 in pi. So what we're doing here is relating that to the atoms themselves. Every possible um, construction of atoms that could exist in an infinite universe probably does exist. I don't know if Epicurus would go that far because he also talks a lot about nature sets limits to these things, which is why, as I said last week, you don't have humans so big that they can wade oceans and part mountains with their bare hands. Yeah, I think you've stated the limitation in the way you said it a moment ago when you said that anything that is natural that could exist. So you've got at least two modifiers there. You've got it's got to be natural and it's got to be something that's possible. And the possibilities do seem to be limited by the nature of the atoms. There are an innumerable number of atoms and there's an innumerable space and innumerable time. But I believe he specifically says that there are certain things that cannot exist. Let me put it one way, which, which would be to this, say, if you go back into the early history of, I guess, multicellular life on Earth, you get insects which are as big as massive birds, right? You picture dragonflies the size of a bald eagle or perhaps bigger. And the reason for that was that it was a particularly oxygen-rich environment. And so if you are a non-vascular animal, like an insect, you know, humans are vascular. We have hearts that constantly pumping all throughout our lives. When they stop pumping, we die. We have vessels, veins, arteries, and so forth that carry blood. And with blood, they carry oxygen to every cell in our body. That's constantly happening. Insects don't have that. They get oxygen basically through their environment. What they don't have is a sophisticated vascular system like you find in hot-blooded animals like mammals. So the upper limit of the size of insects, the reason you'll never see a spider that can, like, like, like Shelob from Lord of the Rings, is that it simply is not sustainable on the planet that we live in. So that's the kind of limit that I think we're talking about here. That's why you can't have, for example, a human that can wade the deepest ocean. And it would seem reasonable that when you reach the conclusion that there are limits to things here on this earth, you're going to presume that these limits are at least possibly applicable on other earths as well. Even though you haven't been to these other planets and you don't know the conditions in these other situations, just because you haven't been there, you don't think that God lives on the moon. You don't allow violations of nature that you can deduce from reasoning that you think is well grounded in the evidence to supersede, to change the conclusions. Again, otherwise, Epicurus would simply have said, well, there's no God here on Earth, but I don't know what's going on in another galaxy. Maybe God exists in that other galaxy. Epicurus does not do that. He takes his conclusions he reaches from the observations he makes here, and he's willing to extend them and say, well, there's no limit in space and time to the universe because there can't be. But on the other hand, at the same time, there's no reason to believe that there's anything supernatural or outside the universe for the same reasons that we have been discussing throughout the crisis and everything we've been talking about. And so, therefore, we don't just jump to the conclusion that, well, it's possible that God exists in some other galaxy. That's a very interesting aspect of Epicurean philosophy is that, again, we don't observe atoms, and yet we believe strongly that they exist to the point of certainty. We don't observe through telescopes or any other way the far side of the universe, and yet we are confident that there's no supernatural God who lives there. There is a movie, I'm trying to look up when it came out, 1960, called Inherit the Wind, and I gather that it's based on a play. It's got Spencer Tracy, Gene Kelly, and so forth. It's a courtroom drama, and the story of the drama is the story of the Scopes monkey trial, mm -hmm. so-called. This question as to whether you're allowed to teach the theory of evolution in the state of Tennessee. In one moment, Spencer Tracy, who is the defense attorney for the teacher who had taught evolution, was now facing charges for it, is reading from the Bible. It's kind of a ridiculous situation almost. And he's reading and he goes through Adam and Eve and so forth. And then he brings up a second name and he looks at the prosecutor and he says, now where the hell did he come from? Did God pull a creation in the next county? <laughs> right. I think that's kind of what we're talking about here is that mm -hmm. once you establish the rules, we've been talking a lot about that today. 
once you establish the rules of materialism that Epicurus has established, things that happen have to accord with those rules, essentially. And it would be as ridiculous as God pulling another creation in the next county to suppose mm. that things are radically, totally different elsewhere in the universe. And so DeWitt says here on 271 in the middle of this discussion that it was from this principle that Epicurus deduced his chief theoretical confirmation of belief in the existence of God. So I think maybe confirmation is the key word there. It was from this that he arrived at knowledge of their number and by secondary deduction at the knowledge of their abode. He so interpreted the significance of infinity as to extend it from matter and space to the sphere of values, that is, to perfection and imperfection. No doubt this is very speculative and hard to pin <laughs> down, but it's also right there in Valeus in Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods. And so somebody who has the time and the inclination to pursue that would find some very interesting material there to pursue. Maybe the part that we need to talk about here, though, is where DeWitt goes next when he talks about Epicurus had to discover a reasonable way of allowing for the triumph of the forces of preservation. In other words, if you're looking at infinity and you say that all these things are possible, well, why isn't it possible that the universe blinks out of existence and comes to an end in whole? What is it about the balance of forces of destruction versus the forces of preservation that allows us to conclude that the forces of preservation are going to win, not in our world and not in any limited part of the world, but in the universe as a whole? Yeah, this is one of the symbolic aspects of Venus in the hymn to Venus in Lucretius's De Rerum Natura is this idea that Venus and Mars represent these forces. This is a poetic tradition going back to Empedocles, um, but also appearing in other Roman poets like Aeneas. And so it's a long tradition that Lucretius is drawing on, but he's expressing it in these purely material terms, which is that atoms come together and atoms fall apart. And the coming together allows things like life, culture, civilization, philosophy, and that for every coming together, there will be a falling apart again, but that there's never any final collapse at, or blinking out of existence, as you said, of the universe itself, right? Right. Let me skip on down to the ending of this subsection, where DeWitt says, by this time, three aspects of the principles of isonomy have been brought forward. First, that in an infinite universe, perfection is bound to exist as well as imperfection. That is, quote, there must be some surpassing being than which nothing is better, unquote. Second, that the number of these beings, the gods, cannot be less than the number of mortals. And third, that in the universe at large, the forces of preservation always prevail over the forces of destruction. All three of these are direct inferences from the infinity and eternity of the universe. There remains to be drawn an indirect inference of primary importance, since in the individual worlds, the forces of destruction always prevail in the end, it follows that the incorruptible gods can have their dwelling places only outside of the individual worlds, the free spaces between the worlds, the so-called intermundia. And so now we switch over and start talking about the life of the gods in the spaces between the worlds in Epicurean theory. Where no wind ever blows, according to the creatures. <laughs> in contrast to the world, which is constantly just imperfect and not made for us and causing us all sorts of pains, this, as Lucretia says, the intermundia just seems to be perfectly balanced and blue skies all the time for the gods. Did you just read off that it said that there is no wind blowing in the intermundia where the gods live? I believe Joshua read that, yes. Yes, Joshua. So that would mean the gods are not material. Well, Joshua was just quoting one of the poetic attributes of it. Yeah, it's hard to know where the poetry ends and the, uh, <laughs> yes. the, the seriousness begins in this chapter for me. And so in this section on the life of the gods, there's a lot of detail that we're probably not going to try to cover here today. But DeWitt mentions several aspects. Here's one that I find interesting, Cassius, is Seneca's response that the life of the Epicurean gods off there in the Intermundia seemed lonely. No living thing, no human being, no property. In so speaking, there was possibly at the back of his mind his own conception of happiness. The life of a wealthy gentleman living on a rural estate, abounding in farm animals, servants, and the physical comforts of life, 
And DeWitt says, Lucretius, however, more vague and romantic than logical at the moment, speaks of nature unasked, supplying every need. And then he goes on to quote Philodemus. And Philodemus, in his essay on the management of an estate, stresses the importance when selecting a country property of ensuring that the purchaser should have neighbors with whom he might enjoy good companionship which means that they might meet often together and engage in philosophical discussion. This is the very pleasure that in his books on the gods he represents as being enjoyed by the divine beings. So an interesting quibble, I think, but the answer being that apparently the gods aren't lonely because at least they have each other. Again, another illustration of how the Epicureans are trying to use common sense from their own experience to discuss the nature of the gods, and they're not hypothesizing something that's so dramatically of a different class than human beings that we can't recognize it. To what quotes Philodemus was saying, quote, philosophical converse with those of their own kind floods good men with ineffable pleasure. And DeWitt says, like earthly Epicureans, the gods would have been social creatures and found maximum enjoyment in the company of one another. And of course, there's where he's quoting Philodemus on what he calls a brace of interesting details. And he says that Philodemus says the gods like human beings must be endowed with speech, for we shall not think of them as more happy and indissoluble if not speaking nor conversing with one another, but like dumb people. And then the second point is the conclusion that they speak Greek. Quote, yes, and I swear by Zeus, he adds, we must believe that they possess the Greek language or something not far different. In no other way do we understand God's existing unless they use the Greek tongue. And that's always a line for <laughs> lots of fun there, especially with some of our Greek friends. But if its judgment provokes a smile, DeWitt says, its interest need not stop with amusement. It had its influence upon Latin literature through a chain reaction and how Lucretius dwelt upon the poverty of the Latin language, but that Cicero shot back at and claimed not mere equality, but superiority for Latin. So in the next section, communion and fellowship, we get this other side of the equation where DeWitt says a kind of communion between the human and the divine was characteristic of both Epicureans and Stoics. The Stoics discovered a basis for this in that spark of the divine fire which resides in every man. But the Epicureans found a basis in the images of the divine beings that float down into the minds of the truly pious. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God was a dictum quite in accord with their beliefs. This is DeWitt once again connecting Epicurean theology and, and so forth with Christianity. And everybody, I think, by now has an opinion on that. Yep, DeWitt cites Lucretius in that same paragraph that is, in fact, very similar. He warns the impious man, quote, that he will not draw near the shrines of the gods with a heart untroubled, nor will he be able to capture the images that come from the sacred persons of the gods that float into the minds of men, harbingers of the form divine. So there's clearly material out there that indicates that the problem with having an impious view of the gods is that you can't visit the temples with a calm heart. You're going to be afraid when you go there. But that if you do visit the temples with a calm heart and a pious view of the gods, then you will profit from the images from them, which are harbingers of the divine form. So there's an audio book I've been listening to on and off called Long Live Latin. It was written, I think, in Italian by uh, Nicola Gardini and then translated and read for Audible by Todd Portnowitz. And so they have a chapter on Lucretius. And one of the things it focuses on is how each different author uses the Latin language. And in Lucretius, Gardini compares Lucretius's use of the word religio in that famous passage, in that famous line, I should say, in book one, where he says, Tantum potuit religio suadere malorum. So potent was religion in persuading to evil deeds. He's comparing that use of religio with what we just read, which comes from a later book, book five, maybe, or book six, in which Lucretius uses the word pietas. So that religio versus pietas issue, that mere superstition relating to uh, the supernatural and their influences is problematic, but that this pietas, this view of looking to the gods as a sort of inspiration for how we should pursue philosophy, that that's how we should really be doing it. 
Yeah, that takes us back to that word attitude that I think we all agree on is really one of the most important aspects of this whole subject. And DeWitt mentions it on 279 here, where he quotes the saying that I think Don mentioned last week, Vatican saying 32, reverence for the wise man is a great blessing for the one that feels the reverence. And so this attitude towards the gods is a friendly one, is a benevolent one, and is something that, if anything, is inspiring and leads to pleasure as opposed to feelings of fear or pain. I would say that we move on to the next section here, just noting that the rest of this section, a lot of it is devoted to the discussion of Epicurus's participation in the festivals and the religious activities of his time and how it does make sense that you could do that when you have the right attitude. So moving on to prophecy and prayer, do it says any scholar who would lay the claim of moral invalidism at the door of Epicurus as a weak case to present when the topic of prophecy or divination is investigated. A man who possessed the moral courage to deny the existence of prophecy and to defy the immemorial beliefs of his own countrymen and to condemn the public practices of all the Greek states can hardly be set down for a moral invalid. And of course, referencing here this this accusation against Epicurus, that all of this discussion about the gods was to do nothing other than to protect himself from being assaulted and forced to drink the hemlock like Socrates had done. What DeWitt's pointing out here is that the basic doctrines of Epicurus to religion would have deserved the same treatment as Socrates had received. And that Epicurus was not really escaping condemnation by describing the gods the way he did, because he was just as open to it as Socrates himself had been. And that that's why we can conclude with confidence that Epicurus wasn't just hiding in his garden and making an excuse to avoid Socrates' fate. He was saying things that were equally as offensive to the Greeks as Socrates had said. I totally agree. And even more than just Socrates Before Socrates, you had Anaxagoras and Aristarchus, and everything that Epicurus says, both about nature and about the gods, is every bit as non-conventional and and potentially dangerous to the very pious as what you find in any of those writers. Anaxagoras was, for example, exiled for saying that the sun was not a god, but a ball of hot metal larger than the Peloponnese. So Epicurus goes much, much further than that in everything he has to say about nature. Do it says, neither can the man whose pronouncements on religion continued to harass the conditioned reflexes of Greeks, Jews, and Romans be cavalierly dismissed as an incoherent thinker. In other words, there, Epicurus didn't just come up with nonsense that these people could just dismiss as nonsense. These people have continuously attacked Epicurean views of the gods ever since Epicurus promoted them. They weren't something they could dismiss lightly because, as DeWitt says, the reason for his criticisms being so biting was an incontestable validity in them. And then in the last paragraph of the page, he says, neither was there lack of courage in making these opinions known. His pronouncement was forthright and uncompromising and published in several writings. The art of prophecy is non-existent, and even if it did exist, external events are to be thought of as meaning nothing to the life within us. And it says here, echoing something Thomas Jefferson said about how we approach claims like the Trinity, DeWitt says, one of the weapons employed against prophecy was ridicule. Cicero is the authority for the statement that there is nothing Epicurus ridicules so much as the prediction of future events. Well, this chapter contains just a series of citations, including I I made reference to something that comes from Josephus, the Roman historian who went to great detail to try to refute Epicurus's position on prophecy by citing the prophecies of Daniel and how they eventually came to pass. He also cites the references in Lucian's Alexander, the Oracle Monger, in which the Epicurean was attacking Alexander for his efforts at prophecy. And it says, quote, divination must have been abominable to Epicurus also because it was inseparable in his world from the sordidness of magic and sorcery. And that quote from Thomas Jefferson, ridicule is the only weapon which can be used against unintelligible propositions. Ideas must be distinct before reason can act upon them. 
and no one ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity. So Mm -hmm. Epicurus, in a very similar vein here, using ridicule to approach some of these ideas in the ancient world. And no one, no one does it better than Lucian of Samosata in his discussion of Alexander. And we will link to the text of that because that is, that is essential reading, I think, on this point. Yes. Here's at the top of 287, he says, even apart from the degradation of the divine and the deception of men through their hopes and fears, Epicurus had an ethical objection to urge against the business of prophecy. A scholium to Aeschylus runs as follows. There is a doctrine of Epicurus denying the art of prophecy because, says he, if fate is the master of all, when foretelling calamity, you have caused pain before the due time. And when foretelling something good, you spoil the pleasure. So that's the other part of prophecy is that it involves us in things like fate, uh, necessity, and you start asking questions about where does free will come into this equation? And if prophecy is real, then there's not much room left for it. And just like there's not much room left for prophecy, there's also not much room, but maybe just a small amount of room for the concept of prayer, which we'll close the chapter on here. Dort quotes Vatican saying 65, it is useless to ask of the gods such blessings as a man is capable of procuring for himself. And he quotes Horace as saying, it is enough to pray to Jupiter for what he gives and takes away, that he give length of life and that he give the means of life. As to the quiet mind, I shall provide for myself. And looking at how this chapter ends, It continues in on some details. It doesn't, to my observation, have a big ending, but it's time as we conclude this episode and conclude our discussion of the chapter for us to come back to the big picture and to have a big ending and emerge from the details that we've been swimming in about whether the gods speak Greek and how tall they are and things like that that are not necessarily of everyday importance to us to come back to the level of things that are of everyday importance to us. Let's close this episode today by talking about our reactions to the whole chapter and any general thoughts we have. Calasini. Yes, I took a few notes and the statement that you made about thinking about the nature of the world as material rather than supernatural is important before difficult things happen or before being confronted by the death of loved ones or oneself, because those who do believe in God, they may tell you that it was God's will. And so being settled and clear about how you think of things is an important aspect of Epicureanism, being clear about the nature of the material world. Anytime something good happens to you, somebody's going to say, isn't God wonderful that he blessed you that way? And then anytime something bad happens to you, isn't God wonderful? He works in mysterious ways and whatever he does works together for good to those who love the Lord. You're always in difficult times or exciting times of life going to be hit with these questions about your relationship to God or the gods. And if you're not prepared for them, you can be thrown off. You can be disconcerted by them at exactly the wrong time, exactly as Lucretius was warning in book one about how people who are concerned that they may go to hell are vulnerable to the manipulations of the priests because they think they have no way to escape these threats. Yeah, you yourself may sometime be drawn away from us by the rant of priests and so forth. So that's right there in book one of Lucretius, and he, he caps that thought by pointing to the human sacrifice of Iphigenia. You know, I said in a recent thread on Catholic guilt that we've mentioned a few times this week and last week, I think what what I said was I I couldn't stop thinking about these things, even if I wanted to. The questions that we ask about nature and about and about death are so, so critically important. And I couldn't bring myself to be uncaring about them, even if I tried. And so even though I find this chapter a little bit too deep and a little bit too devoted to the particulars than maybe I would like, because it's not something that particularly interests me, I do find the broader subject very, very interesting. And it's something that I think about every single day of my life. Yeah, we've had good reminders of that. Not only the Catholic guilt thread you're talking about, but again, Don's recent post on the discussion between the priest and the atheist. And these are issues that will confront us and do cause lots of problems for lots of people, probably for all of us at some stage in our life. And even though we might currently feel like we've resolved these questions 
it's almost guaranteed that when something bad happens to us, these same questions come back to us again. And the best way to be prepared for them is to have thought about them ahead of time. And going through some of the details that the Epicureans were thinking about gives us an example of the approach that can be used. Again, following Epicurus's advice to Pythocles, thinking about the implications of infinity. You know, that might be ultimately the response to that Catholic priest that Don was talking about. We don't let the infinite chain of causation cause us to go crazy and start believing in heaven and hell and a supernatural God. If you're not comfortable with this issue of an infinite chain of causation being just as reasonable and more consistent with the evidence than a supernatural realm and a supernatural God, then it would be good advice from Epicurus to start getting comfortable with that idea. And the way to do it ultimately is to trace down through philosophy, through logic, through reason and through evidence These questions that other people are going to assert to you at some time are simply a matter of faith. If there's anything that Epicurus doesn't have a whole lot of good to say about, it is blind faith in people like Plato or in religion or in the different stories about the gods that humanity is constantly flooded with. Epicurean philosophy is an antidote to that. And this section on the new piety is an emphasis on the right attitude to have about that subject. Next week, we're going to change focus. We're going to go to chapter 14 on the new virtues. And we will once again, as we near the end of the book, get back to this question that is of prime importance to so many people. What do you mean by virtue? What's the nature of virtue? Is virtue its own reward? What is the relationship between virtue and pleasure? How does virtue fit with an Epicurean philosophy? That's a very big subject, and we'll start it next week. In the meantime, drop by the forum and let us know your questions and comments, and we'll see you in the next episode.